Hello everybody, welcome to Sunday night and almost a functional system. <laughs> so I have been putting off buying a new computer because everything, my life is on this computer. But when you run into the computer keeps crashing because I'm asking it to do too many things and it's from like 2012. Okay, yeah. watch them for your checks. Uh, <laughs> hold on, I can hear myself. Hello hungry. everybody, welcome hold to on. Sunday night Why is that and happening? almost a functional hold system. <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure if, um, okay, I am watching these uh, comments and I want anybody to tell me if they can hear anything that they're not supposed to hear on this video. Um, thank you for uh, tuning in and um, somewhere there's a sound on that I don't know how to turn it off. Uh, let's see, Jack is texting me, he'll tell me what to do. Uh, YouTube is looping. You got it. Okay, so now it's working. Actually, I just plugged in the the uh, my to, to cover up the sound. So hopefully that makes normal sense to everybody else. Anyway, welcome. I have a really good show tonight. I have some really cool things that we get to talk about, and I am very excited for everybody that has had enough forgiveness to last the first four minutes here. Um, so let's just do a couple of things. I just want to say hi to the folks that have checked in. Uh, those of you that uh, tell me where you're from, it really does. Um, so, uh, mean so much. I, I go back and I've learned so many of your names just by saying, oh yes, they're here. Angela, I know you're from Tennessee because I see you all the time. <laughs> Thank you. I really do appreciate the support. Uh, you know, signing up to, to do YouTube is a, sounds like an easy thing and then you start doing it and you're like, does anybody care? But uh, the following has been just an incredible uh, voice of support and I just think of all the patients out there that are improving their health. Uh, one ketone at a time is what I like to say. Um, using a patient, real patient stories is what this channel is all about. I'm an internal medicine physician, so you can definitely see my energy come alive when I uh, talk about real patients with real stories and um, then loop them into their struggles. Um, I've got... Um, you know, my own panel of patients here in South Dakota, but when I look at the impact uh, the book has had, and then the thousands of people that have taken the book to their doctor and improved that relationship, improved that understanding, I just think there is hope <laughs> for the dying medical system in, South, in, uh, in America for improving their health, losing weight, and really staying as far away from the doctor's office, um, at least for chronic illnesses, as possible. So I am uh, going to give you an update today. So I'll just give you a backstory of um, Lachlan's history. And I'm actually kind of nervous to put her on the screen because I think the only way you can hear her is through this speaker. <laughs> and when I plugged it in last time, it was looping. So hopefully I can at least catch you up to where she's at. And then by the time I... Um, put her on. I know what to do with the buttons on how to not make it loop. So um, let's just uh, say that Lachlan's been my patient for about a decade and she is a very busy woman who runs her own business and she shows up uh, about 10 years ago and was having recurrent um, infections, just really getting sick. Uh, she was losing a little weight, um, which she didn't mind, but she really didn't feel good. She was tired all the time. Um, a few blood checks later and we found out that she has type 1 diabetes, meaning her pancreas stopped producing insulin. So this was over like almost nine years ago. We put her on insulin. We corrected her, uh, her lack of uh, production for insulin. And over the next 10 years, she proceeded to put on almost 100 pounds thanks to my prescription. Um, we overshot her insulin because our medicines are wonderful and it is great to live in the advent of uh, all the modern uh, medicines, but unfortunately uh, we aren't nearly as good as her pancreas would have been, so we spent more time overshooting her, um, her numbers and excess insulin leads to en excess insulation. Um, excess insulin is a growth hormone, so she had other things like some skin tags that kept coming back and we would clip them off and they would grow back and we would clip them off and they would grow back. Um, so many of her problems were because of the prescriptions that I had provided. 
very rarely did we talk about um, uh, nutrition. Uh, I think maybe once or twice I'd said something about South Beach diet, increasing fiber, decreasing the amount of processed foods, but it was very superficial and unfortunately um, ignored that. I used most of the, my prescription pad to help her. Um, about three and a half years ago, I started the ketogenic diet with the help of encouraging my mom at 71 to use that to help her cancer journey. And it was about four or five months later that I started reaching out to Lachlan saying, you should do keto. You should do keto with me. You should do keto. So unfortunately, timing is, uh, wasn't right at the time, but that's okay. We kept saying, when you're ready, you should come do keto. When you're ready, you should come do keto. Uh, in fact, I do a support group here in Sioux Falls um, where anybody who wants to learn about the ketogenic diet and has questions they want to ask in person, um, the super secret code word to get in is that you need to know what a ketone is. But that support group, I think, is has a huge ripple effect for what, um, what uh, not only Lackland's health ha has had an impact for, but all the people um, uh, who show up and just say, I just want to learn a little bit more. And then they get their their ketone story straight and then they go off into their own families and spread that into their loved ones improving their health as well so i think that one and one and a half hours each friday morning has turned into a bigger impact on healthcare than probably seeing patients for a whole month because of how much those messages have rippled forward so tonight we have some updates on Lackland's health, which is what I'm very excited to share. So we started this, uh, we finally said, all right, Lackland, I'm gonna, I'd like you to be one of the focused patients on my YouTube channel. And each week we'll check in with how your keto journey is doing and we want all, all your warts, we want all your problems to show up on the, on the Sunday night channel. And, um, you know, I said, read the book if you want to, but more importantly, uh, I will, I will um, I will guide you through these mistakes and uh, you, you won't believe how much uh, improvement happens just by lowering your carbohydrates. So she agreed and our first visit was somewhere I think in February, maybe late January, early February. Each Sunday we come back and most of the times we're both present but uh, uh, sometimes I've had to have a video recording of her. At the beginning, we had some labs checked and just announced those online. And today, we're going to announce how they look um, almost, yeah, it's a little over three months later. So let's see here. I, I'm going to have to look at Zoom here before I click over to her audio. And do one little click before I bring her in. Uh, hold on here. Zoom, zoom. Just I'm gonna have you just sit, hold tight one minute till I push this button because it's not gonna work out. Same as just me. Okay, we're gonna see if this works. Lackland, can you speak? I think it's working. Okay, uh, we're gonna see if this works, and if we loop, we're just gonna have to turn our sound off, but I'm gonna try to do this. All right, so here is Lachlan. Um, actually, we're gonna use this one first. Uh, Lachlan, let's check your sound. How you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. How are you? Okay, so <laughs> I would love to know if, uh, actually, I've taken the comments off, so I can't see them while I'm up on this page. Oh, okay, so you should tell us if they can hear two voices or one. <laughs> Can they hear two of you? You think it's working? Okay. No sound from Lackland, it says. No sound from Lackland. Oh, shoot. Um, oh, it's not you. It's, it's definitely me. Hold on here. Let's see if I can find... I'm gonna go into, um, it's gonna to have to go into OBS and, oh. <laughs> I 
can't hear it, can't hear it. Can't. Okay, so now hang tight because I am I'm working on it. I will I have to push something here is audio and zoom. And I'm going to say um, default. Try that. All right, now I'll try it, Lachlan. Okay. So she just said the words, can you hear me now? And if you can hear, she's watching the comments, so hang tight. Interesting. Okay. This is the part when you're not very technical. I might just have to have her mute, and I'm just going to show her the labs of what she would have she would have seen um, without... Uh, I, I'll get to hear her comments, but you guys won't. <clears throat> So let's see here. I'm going to take this one down. I'm going to go into this uh, here. And one more time. Nothing but now with an echo. <laughs> what a nightmare. Okay. So I'm going to see if file. Um, hang on. We're going to try one more thing. Oh, good Lord. Okay. So two more minutes. I'm just going to try one more time because I really want to tell you how great her labs turned out in the last three months. And right now, all you're going to do is, so let's go to Zoom. Let's go to Preferences. We're just going to go to, um... oh, the echo's gone. Good audio on Dr. Boz. Okay. So let's see if that works. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to let you see Lachlan's face, and I can hear her, but you guys can't hear her. So we're going to do a couple things. I'm going to tell you her updates and uh, give you some background. So one of the things we worked on with Lachlan was that we checked some of her fat-based uh, vitamins. When I look at people on a ketogenic diet and I say, well, we're going to start some baselines, the sugar is what people say, of course, you're going to check my sugar and you're going to check my cholesterol. But the next thing uh, that I totally am a big fan of is uh, checking some of the fat-based hormones that we can check. So when it comes to Lachlan's um, uh, easiest lab that we could check, vitamin D, and all of you can do this too, vitamin D is a fat-based hormone. When you look at uh, vitamin D in most people, especially in South Dakota, because we are so far north that our winters really do block uh, the sun from converting our vitamin D into its active form. So we can see lots and lots of <laughs> the highly entertaining Lachlan who's now mute. Uh, we can see lots and lots of patients who their vitamin D gets lower and lower each season that they spend in the winters of South Dakota. Um, so I have some old labs from Lachlan. Uh, in 2017, we checked her vitamin D and it was 30. Uh, 30 is low. We love it above 50, but you're going to see most doctors say at least get it above 40. Um, I kind of like to see the good cholesterol, the HDL, and the um, vitamin D to be the same. So we'll get to her good cholesterol here in a minute. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. So back, you know, two and a half years ago, actually about two years ago exactly, after another winter, her vitamin D was down to 30. Uh, when we started this in February, her vitamin D was down to 24. And I did an episode where I talked about how vitamin D, when it gets that low, it actually has been shown to not just increase her risk of breast cancer, increase her risk of depression, increase her risk of memory problems, uh, colon cancers associated with that low of a vitamin D. But also there's uh, cognitive uh, deficits, like you can watch the ability for them to solve a puzzle, almost like an IQ barometer, that amazingly their, um, their assessments uh, and their puzzle solving skills get lower with vitamin D. We talk about the ketogenic diet and its correlation to improve cognition, the brain's ability to, to masterfully um, repair and uh, to reverse so many of the symptoms of depression when it's nourished properly, when there's a lack of inflammation. And so when, I do, when somebody comes in and wants to be on the ketogenic diet, I like to check a few things at the beginning. The sugar test, like we're going to go through her sugar test. She's diabetic, so that was going to be done anyway. Uh, the cholesterol is always very interesting for me to check. Uh, I would 
caution you that if you do a cholesterol check, you're, we're going to make sure you don't do it too soon. Um, and then uh, I love vitamin D because of what else it correlates to. Um, so we did her vitamin D, and I, I actually in in that episode said yes, you can you can take vitamin D. Um, it's easily supplemented. It's not. Um, difficult. You can get it over the counter or you can get a prescription. But I also assigned Lachlan the, I want you to go to the tanning bed and spend four to eight minutes in a tanning bed once a week. And there's almost something sacrilegious to say that because I spent 20 years of my practice saying, don't do tanning beds. They're the antichrist. You're going to have skin cancer. And what I was ignoring is how valuable if the tanning bed has UVB, as in boy, UVB rays in it, how much it can increase your vitamin D. So the first person that I really looked at this uh, intensely was my 75-year-old dad. His vitamin D was in the teens, and he has kidney failure, so he needed this up. He was taking 10,000 units and then 50,000 units of vitamin D. We were getting nowhere, and I assigned him to four minutes in the tanning bed a week, and he came back, and it was 52 after six weeks of time in the tanning bed. Actually, excuse me, it was, it was nine weeks in the tanning bed. And his doctor said, oh, I think you're overdosing on the vitamin D. And I'm like, yeah, he wasn't taking the supplement. He was only doing the tanning bed. Uh, and what a blessing to him because of how much improved his mood. Um, so there's, one, there's step one for saying here's a... Here's uh, what happened with her vitamin D, but uh, let's move on to what happened with her cholesterol. So she actually hasn't seen these numbers yet, uh, so let's just do, do some review. And I've never seen Lachlan so quiet in my whole life. <laughs> so uh, in March um, of 2017, you know, she's actually had really good low cholesterol numbers. And as much as that sounds like a really good idea, I'll tell you that I've always worried about her cholesterol numbers, um, knowing that someday her youth will not keep up with what, what we were doing to her body, which is every diabetic, it is something we follow closely. We know that their risk of heart disease is um, many times higher because of our extra insulin. We overshoot their insulin. Those higher insulin states increase the risk of heart disease. So as I look at some of the numbers, we had the February numbers just three months ago, and now we have today's numbers. So if you'll take a look, her total cholesterol in February 145 and today 147. So again, not much change. That's not always the way this goes. Uh, when I warned you earlier that if you're getting labs done on a ketogenic diet, a baseline is wonderful. It's nice to know where you start out, but it's incredible how many patients uh, then quickly want to go out and get their cholesterol checked. And I've covered this several times, but I will do it again, that your cholesterol is actually a marker of, um, uh, it's a transporter of fats. So on the ketogenic diet with low carbohydrates and high fats, you are going to put fats into your system and you're going to ask something more of your cholesterol. You're going to ask the cholesterol to move those fats around from your liver to your skin cells, from your intestines to your kidneys. Uh, delivering fat is what cholesterol does. And on the ketogenic diet, your cholesterol will go up. However, it's not the end-all be-all. When looking at cholesterol, I contend that it is one part of how to predict heart disease. Uh, so let's just take a closer look at Lackland's numbers. She's always been able to boast about a healthy cholesterol that's been pretty good. If you remember, I've wanted her to keep, we want the healthy cholesterol or the HDL to be the same as the uh, vitamin D. <laughs> so they're both fatty, uh, good hormones. And before her HDL was 51, anytime it's above 50, we give them a few extra points saying that's a that's a protective. Um, and it was 51 in 2017, and it was 51 again uh, in February when we started. But it's fallen down to 37. And uh, I'll talk about that in here in just a minute. Let's move on to the last couple of things. In 2017, her triglycerides, uh, which um, are a product of how how well processed the carbohydrates or how, how fast your body is processing carbohydrates, her triglycerides were really low, like 65. 
it correlated to a low inflammatory marker. That bottom one is probably my most important marker of a, a cholesterol panel, and that's called a highly sensitive C-reactive protein. Lachlan has always been, uh, <laughs> she's kind of blown my mind that she has diabetes. It was not controlled. And her, C -reactive, her highly sensitive C-reactive protein was always quite low. Um, so again, what that C-reactive protein does is that's an inflammatory marker. This helps me predict um, how, how worried I am about uh, inflammation on the insides of her blood vessels. Um, when we look at inflammatory markers, if I would, um, you know, her son plays baseball, let's say a fly ball comes off and, her, and hits her in the, in the arm and causes a really big bruise. In that um, time where the blood kind of came out of the blood vessels and went into the muscle, it really inflamed her body. All of these inflammatory markers would rise. And you would see her highly sensitive C-reactor protein would go up. So would things like her SED rate. So would um, um, a, the, the cheaper version of this test called the C-reactor protein. Um, these are all kinds of proteins that's, that kind of migrate around the system and start to heal things that are inflamed. The highly sensitive C-reactor protein is a specific uh, um, marker that helps me think about the lining of the insides of the blood vessels. So think about if a camera was looking down her artery, I'd want to know how inflamed is that artery. And if you can keep that number below one, you'll keep me off your back. I will not chirp about inflammation. But there will be a tipping point. Um, youth has an end point. <laughs> and as your body ages, and then you look at that great face. Um, as your body ages, then the inflammation starts to do things like wear on your brain, wear on your heart, and increase your risk of cancer. So in February, when she had the first, and I've probably done eight of these highly sensitive C-reactor proteins over the years, and they've all been at 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, so really good numbers. Um, but in February, there was a little tickle of a warning for me when her C-reactive protein was above one. When it's above three, you really see me get excited. But when it was above one, I'm like, boy, that's double of where it was the last time I checked. And again, uh, what a perfect timing for her to step into this realm of uh, a ketogenic diet. Uh, we want to lower her risk of inflammation. So then we look at that, that cholesterol panel that came back, and her LDL cholesterol is still very good. Even by the, the standards of today, they would say, yep, she's a diabetic. She should be on a statin. That's usually the end of the conversation. But when your LDL cholesterol is less than 100, you're going to have a tough time uh, saying you have to be on one. Uh, the guidelines actually want me to push that LDL cholesterol below 70 I think using just the guidelines and not having it in context for what we're doing would be an error in her health. Uh, and there are lots of other risk factors that someone so young uh, would be put on a statin for usually an eternity. Uh, what I think is interesting is the triglycerides bumped up. Uh, again, that's how quickly she can process the carbohydrates she's using. Um, still very good. If you get under 150, I'm going to say you're good. If you keep it under 100, I'll think those triglycerides are great. Um, and again, her total cholesterol is only 147. So uh, the, the parts that are moving things throughout her system is what I'm looking at. So the complexity, when I look at a cholesterol panel, what I'm really trying to, to look at is how stagnant is her cholesterol. Meaning when, when a part of a nutrient goes into her liver, how long does it take her body to move that nutrient to where it needs to go? And some of the highest risks for cholesterol patients is if you could, if you could tag their cholesterol and see, um, you know, once your body makes this cholesterol, does it get to move it and shuffle it where it needs to go, which is why we have cholesterol. It is actually protective. It is your mechanism for improving uh, the delivery of nutrients and the turnover of cells in your body. However, uh, there isn't a marker. You, you have to look at the the, this kind of pattern recognition as a physician. I look at her pattern recognition from 2017, looking at total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and I know over time that um, th that's actually, those are good profiles, but as I've watched her numbers over time, I worry about the inflammation and when that C-reactive protein bumped up and um, you know that her HDL went down. Uh, it says, oh, she's probably not recycling her cholesterol as much as she was. And the ketogenic diet says, oh, she's probably using it. It's probably getting used for other um, 
uh, uh, the, the nutrients is much more efficiently being used in her system. Uh, it is something that we'll keep an eye on, but I don't make decisions based on just cholesterol panels alone. Um, there's some really exciting news that, that Lachlan has. Before we get to the exciting news, I'm going to show you one little picture that's kind of science-y, but I think is worth looking at. Um, and this is what we call cholesterol related to steroid horm hormones. What you would have heard her tell you, <laughs> had she had sound, is that she texted me this past week. She knew the labs were back and I was ready to tell her the good news uh, about her vitamin D is up really high. Uh, her cholesterol isn't showing me terrible warning signs that there's a little bit of bump in the inflammatory marker, um, but we're going to keep an eye on that. And, um, and then her A1C, which we'll get to in a minute. But what was concerning to her, the text was, you know, Dr. Boz, we've had this problem. Uh, I don't want to have any more kids, but um, I've kind of sputtered on where my, my menstrual cycles were. So she'd have just a little bit of bleeding and then nothing for a while. And then maybe three months later, a little bit of bleeding and then nothing for a while. And this week she had probably the first full menstrual cycle she's had in, show, up, show me how many years has it been, uh, Lachlan? Hmm. Yeah, five, seven, seven years for, this is a huge moment here. I just really want the women to appreciate this. So she tells me something's wrong, something's wrong. I haven't had a period in, you know, seven years. A couple of times where I've just been bleeding a little bit, but nothing that's like this. I'm cramping and this is like unheard of in her history recently, right? That's the face every woman would say like, no period in seven years and now I'm bleeding something terrible. And I was excited. I was like, that is a breakthrough. And she's like, did you hear me? I just told you this is, I'm having a period. What? And I'm like, no, no, no. Here's the problem with um, polycystic ovarian disease, um, insulin resistance, or my type 1 diabetics where I take over the driver's seat for her insulin. And of course, I'm going to give her too much insulin. That's what happens. I can't be as good as her pancreas. Even with the perfect pump, uh, unless she's got those low number of carbohydrates, we're going to lose. So what happens is I make her insulin resistant. I give her metabolic syndrome on top of her type 1 diabetes. And when we do that, what it does to her ovaries and her uterus is that her hormone level inside her body gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And the reason I bring this chart up is these hormones inside her system um, that run her, her menstrual cycle are all fat-based. So, um, you know, looking, my, I can't point with this, but if you could look there, the cholesterol turns into progesterone. That's one of the hormones to help a menstrual cycle. Estradiol is estrogen, the vitamin D we've talked about, and then cortisol is one of the stress hormones. Although testosterone is made in a woman, it gets converted to, oh, it flips back and forth between testosterone and estradiol. And in fact, when you have a high amount of insulin, the estrogen kind of trickles over into the testosterone more than it should. You'll see increased facial hair, you'll see decreased libido, increased um, depression. All of these happen in the setting of a very low fat diet, usually associated with a high carbohydrates and high insulin. So in Lachlan's case, this happened. And although she didn't complain about not having a period, uh, I could have probably guessed that her periods were pretty wimpy. And what I know is happening was that her hormone level was just bumping along. It wasn't a robust hormones when measuring her fat hormones. That is common in a low fat diet. Um, it is common in insulin resistance. And it is the source of the problem in people with polycystic ovarian disease or PCOS. Often they'll present to the doctor with a low um, low, trouble getting pregnant and we'll start talking about hormones and you know giving them more estrogen and giving them progesterone and um, really fighting against what their body is weak on is uh, it's a difficult battle. So I expect at about three months when patients are on a ketogenic diet that their hormone level will rise. That increased hormone levels um, in the ketogenic diet um, are especially the fat-based hormones, which is the ones on this slide, begin when the nutrients has now been delivered successfully to that ovary, to the brain, and to your adrenal glands. Um, people say, what should I do for an adrenal fatigue situation? And instantly I'm like, get your fat-based hormones higher. So when I look at the, the danger, the signal that is broken in a ketogenic, or before a ketogenic diet, in 
in an insulin resistant patient or in a patient with polycystic ovarian disease or in a type 1 diabetic like Lachlan. It is that her hormone signals are wimpy. With those wimpy hormone signals, uh, she could never fully empty her uterus. She was trickling out a little bit of menstruation every once in a while when the uterus would get overly full. And although that sounded like a good thing, it increases her risk of ovarian cancer, increases her risk of endometrial cancer, uh, and is a product of chronic inflammation, which is the number one reason why I promote the ketogenic diet, decrease the inflammation. So in this uh, chart, you'll see that um, the standard American diet, what I'm trying to point out here is how low those hormones are. Lachlan is a perfect example. She didn't care. She had plenty of other things to worry about. It's like, ah, no period in seven years. That's great. And I'm like, really, it's not. And you want that uterus emptying. You do not want that. Um, I mean, even if it's only a couple of periods a year, which, which we can have that discussion on a different, uh, different night, uh, the, the benefit is that her system is flushing on its own. And the only way it can do that is when those hormones peak and valley, peak and valley. Uh, hormones that, that sputter because of the low fat delivery, uh, and that's that constant low malnourishment of fat, turns into a very low signal for her hormones. As we revived her hormones over the last three months, we now have a peak and a valley. And the beauty in that is that as much as she was a little irritated by a menstrual cycle, I, I'm telling you that 10 years from now, we are going to be so thankful that she has regular, or at least a couple of times a year, we can make her hormones, we'll give her a period. Um, so I hope that's helpful. I want, yeah, she can say a little grumpy face for the menstrual cycle, but as her physician, I couldn't be happier that she had that. All right, two more slides and then we're, we will be <laughs> wrapping it up. Uh, I'll go back to some questions. So we'll have you typing them in here in just a minute. Um, all right, so the blood sugars, uh, this is just a cycle of people saying, tell me what happened there. When I took um, over her insulin production, the insulin production in her system increased her cortisol. Uh, cortisol is a stress hormone that also increases blood sugar. Uh, the blood sugar goes up, now she needed more insulin. Uh, so that's the cycle in a type 1 diabetic, but it's also the cycle that happens in, a, uh, in somebody who's overweight or insulin resistant. Uh, insulin resistance is, um, starts usually with um, a high blood sugar and your body will make some more insulin. That increases your stress, that increases the cortisol level, and you'll have higher blood sugars again. And this cycle continues and continues and continues. And I put that angry little inflamed insulin next to that because most people don't make a trickle of insulin in this cycle. They make lots of insulin. And it inflames the insides of their blood vessels. It inflames their brain, their joints, their heart. And um, the only part that you have true control over is to stop the blood sugars from being so high. The way you do that is you cut carbs. You stop them. Zip, zilch. Have zero time with that. Um, okay, so they're going to get to the big punchline. We have her, uh, her lab tests that are her glucose that are back. So if you might remember that her average blood sugars when we were looking at them in 2017 were 283. That takes her to an hemoglobin. Yes, look at that smiley face. This is why I was always amazed that her cholesterol looks so good. I'm like, how? You are like blessed by the gods with the anti-inflammatory factor. And if we can fix all things before that gift wears out, praise Jesus. That's beautiful. That's good luck and God and all those things. So then when we started in February, um, her A1C was still 10, which is an average blood sugar of 240. Uh, I think we counted the weeks uh, between these two tests, and it was right at about 12 weeks. Uh, so again, when we're looking at hemoglobin A1C, we're looking at her red blood cells, and we're looking to see how sticky are they. Um, the hemoglobin, um, uh, the, the outside of the red blood cell will get some, just think of it as sticky. Some It'll get glycosylated. It's actually parts of a a molecule that's a lot like sugar. And the higher the sugars in the blood, the more sticky parts go to that red blood cell. Uh, there's lots of associated dangers with that. And I would contend that if you look at the biggest risk for heart disease that Lachlan has, it's associated with her hemoglobin A1C. That I told her with a ketogenic diet, we are going to get that little puppy into the fives or sixes. And she's like, even when I was, you know, before I was diagnosed, she's not sure it was that low. And I would 
say maybe. But uh, we got an amazing res response in a 12-week time of dropping her hemoglobin A1C to 8.3. And when I told her, I was like emotional. Like that is, I, there's not a medication on the market that we could have done that with. And I just can't praise her enough for saying, good job for sticking to it. Good job for doing her fasting. And I think this is a, a perfect timing to make sure that um, everybody who isn't uh, following her on Instagram, uh, this is a, a great little plug to help her. Uh, as she does her fasting with me on Sundays and then into Mondays, we're not quite sure how everybody's going to do that with the holiday tomorrow. So um, I have... I have intentions of fasting after these lives, but sometimes a really stressful live will send me right into eating. So um, <laughs> I will tell you that I'm not sure I'm going to fast, but you can follow my numbers uh, on the same uh, the same way. So in uh, that that is her handle on Instagram, and any folks out there putting in the this hashtag Dr. Boz Ratio, I try to follow up and give you encouragement if you post those on Instagram. I am trying to get to the total of 10,000 followers on Instagram, and I'm like at 7,200. So if you don't follow me on Instagram, please do, and follow Lachlan as well. Um, the two of us post our numbers back and forth, and it is, it's is—it's really encouraging uh, to watch how many other people fast with you. And why we chase that Dr. Boz ratio is it is a reflection of the needed insulin. So when, when Lachlan fasts, we know that we're being safe about her insulin being lower. Um, and um, you, she actually finds that the times when she fasts is when she's able to lose weight. As a type 1 diabetic, um, I have textbooks that say once you start them on insulin, they never lose weight. Um, they never lose weight. So, all right. So we will uh, <laughs> tell Lachlan that she's had the best experiment for sitting quietly that she's had in her adult years. <laughs> And next week, either I'm going to have to buy a new computer um, or I'm going to have to have a doctorate level in how to run the sound <laughs> to not do that again. All right, I'll let you sign off, Lachlan, and I am going to go back and answer some questions really quick before I finish out. <laughs> so, all right, thank you, thank you, thank you for everybody putting up with that. And uh, Lachlan is a trooper for uh, letting um, us not uh, give up and just sit there quietly. Uh, some of those, she didn't know the answers to her own, uh, she hadn't seen her cholesterol labs. I just told her the A1C and, and that her vitamin D was improved. So just give her a, a shout out. A, you know, that's her personal health care, and she's agreed to come and do this online as a way to inspire people. Um, what an amazing uh, journey she's had. And that, um, that beauty of uh, not just improving her lab numbers, but the way she focuses her, she's like the enjoyment that she can feel in life has really been a, a restoration and an inspiration to people watching. So um, many people say, I didn't think type one diabetics could do a ketogenic diet, which is why I selected her, um, not just because I care deeply about her and her journey, but I also, um, uh, really find that if you can give somebody the encouragement um, who's got a really tough journey. Type 1 diabetes is not easy, especially in a case like this. A single mom running on her own business, doing her very best to, um, to use this uh, opportunity to improve her health and inspire her children to not uh, end up in the same place. So all right, there's a couple questions I've just seen on the on the live chat that I want to talk about. Can keto reverse kidney disease? So you probably heard earlier that I talk about my dad. My dad's kidney disease is at 18%, uh, and he is a strong South Dakota stubborn farmer who says, I am not doing dialysis. I've seen people that's not the life I want. And I say that with a heavy heart because I do think there's going to be a day in the next year that that's going to lead to a funeral. Um, he continues to accumulate fluid in his lung, and we just drained it again last week, taking two and a half liters off of his lung. Uh, that's a pop bottle of two liters plus another half a liter after that. So when we say, can we reverse his kidney disease with a ketogenic diet? The answer is no, we can't reverse it. We can't make new kidney cells for my dad. Um, but what I can do is help the kidney function that he has be the most, um, the most supported. So one of the things we did for my dad when he got down to 24% of his kidney function, uh, and the reason he has 24% kidney function was because he had high blood pressure. He had some high blood sugars, not diabetic, but definitely pre-diabetic. He had a little bit of a tummy, like every South Dakota guy I know. 
uh, at least South Dakota farmers mostly. <laughs> um, he had meat and potatoes his whole life, but he also had lots of processed food, um, lots of extra treats because they were available and tasted good. And that constant high pressure from the high blood pressure, that increased inflammation from having high blood sugars, and um, just 75 years of living uh, has worn out his kidneys. Um, so once the kidney function is gone, you can't restore it, but now you're gonna, you can calculate how much could his kidneys support. So when he got down to 24% of his kidney function, I sat down and said, Dad, I get that you're 210 pounds and that looks pretty good compared to your neighbors, but your kidneys are built for about 162 pounds. And if you want to not be on dialysis, we're gonna have to get your weight down. And of course, mom had been on the ketogenic diet and done really well, and dad did good for a while, and then not so good. Um, I'll tell you, his approach is much better when we do uh, no eating for 36 hours, as opposed to my mom's pretty good with one meal a day, keeps those meals, um, what she can handle and what her system and numbers uh, look pretty good. But as soon as my dad starts eating, he kind of snacks his way through life. And even though they're ketogenic snacks, when you only have 24% kidney function, there was not a lot of room for forgiveness. So his kidney function turned into even more decline as he got off some of the weight and then put some back on. But now he hangs out at about 162 pounds and if we can keep the fluid out of his lungs, he'll be okay. But we have shorter intervals where the lung fills up and his kidneys say, I can't do it all. Um, so the answer is you can't reverse kidney disease, but by golly, can you make it easier on the kidneys with a ketogenic diet? Absolutely. Uh, especially when it came to vitamin D, that's a very important marker that we follow in people with chronic kidney disease. And I couldn't be more happy for my dad that we struggled for four years with a, a vitamin D that was in, in the 30s, then in the 20s, and then in the teens, despite massive doses of replacement um, um, replacement um, supplements, uh, prescription strength vitamin D, and we still couldn't get it out of the sink. You know, it just kept going down. Uh, we put him under the tanning bed with UVB rays for four minutes a week. Eventually he made it to eight minutes a week, and by golly, boom, his kidney, his vitamin D was up to 52, and his mental status reflected that. So I, uh, how is the liver worst? Oh, that's another one. I'm a South Dakotan and I love, um, I don't know if, if you've never seen what a Hutterite community is. One of the best parts about a Hutterite community is they all have a recipe for liver worst. Um, and they're little communities that they live in about 150 people. They uh, have a strong like Anabaptist uh, uh, commitment where uh, at about uh, that 12 or 13, the, the children, um, don't have as strong a commitment to the, the scholastics and they learn a trade in their community. Um, but wonderful people that I've learned so much from and um, uh, they make great liverwurst. <laughs> so when I told them that I recommend this, they said, no, that's in our doctrine. We say that too. We tell our next generation that once a week they need to have a bite of liverwurst. And of course that's really nice fatty uh, food and also really good uh, supplement for your iron. All right, last question that I have to buzz off, um, and that was, can you reverse fatty liver with a ketogenic disease? That was a comment that just came up. The answer is yes. That is the reason why when I was looking at Lackland's labs and I looked at some of that inflammation, um, what I didn't show you is that one of the markers in her liver kept ticking up, not out of the normal range, completely normal. Every other doctor would say, eh, it's fine, no problem. She's going to be just fine. But the constant slight uptick in her liver enzymes totally uh, mattered when it came to um, predicting how much inflammation was happening on the insides of her body. And of course, the liver is the first place that your body stores sugar. Uh, if you don't use that sugar, it will then become a triglyceride or a, 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 it's a fat component. And again, the liver is where you store them. When I talk about that cholesterol turning over or churning through your, your fat, that's what I'm asking is I want your body to go to the liver, pick up some fat, deliver it to the body. And if it's not moving the fat out of the liver, it becomes stagnant, it becomes still, it's not moving, it's not churning. And when we look at cholesterol that goes up once you are on the ketogenic diet, what we're really looking at is we're starting to churn and move that cholesterol around, which is an improvement in your health, not a risk of health. 
So looking strictly at your total cholesterol numbers is not the place to look at for predicting heart disease. Looking at inflammatory markers, looking at sugars, looking at your waistline, looking at your blood pressure, and looking at your liver enzymes all are in places that you can improve with a ketogenic diet, and those do predict heart disease. All right, so I'm signing off. I just want to say thank you to anybody that's written a re review on my book. This is how... Uh, we support this channel. If you haven't bought the book um, or if you've bought the book and you have a doctor that doesn't know about the ketogenic diet, please buy them a book and gift it to them. These stories keep coming into my emails and it just warms my heart. So thank you for anybody who's supported me by leaving a review. It means everything to me. That's how this channel keeps going. And I swear someday there's going to be a second book, but it is uh, in the very beginning stages. <laughs> So thanks again, and I will go back and look at these uh, again. Apologies for the onset of this uh, recording, but uh, life has seasons, and this was one of very poor audio recording. Here's to helping your health one ketone at a time. See you next week, guys.